I am Brian Cardell. I'm a developer advocate at Egalia. And I'm Eric Meyer, also a developer advocate at Egalia. And so we've had like lots of different kinds of shows. Uh, but this time we're kind of talking that we see a lot of buzz on the Twitters and uh, in blog posts and on podcasts that we listen to. Uh, seems a lot of people are really excited by, holy cow, wow, there's so much stuff happening in, uh, especially in CSS, but like, it's just really, really exciting. Like what, what happened to ignite this fire? Eric, you've, you've seen this. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, seems like at least once a week and frequently more frequently than that, uh, you know, people, you'll see people on Twitter or in the RSS feeds, you know, saying, holy crap, this, like you said, this thing that was impossible for so long is suddenly easy to do. Or, oh, this thing that I heard about a couple of years ago that seemed like it would be really cool, you know, in some unspecified future when it was implemented is now already implemented. For that matter, hey, there's stuff that we've been wanting for a quarter century and suddenly it's here. Um, all that kind of stuff. It's been characterized, somebody referred to it as sort of the Cambrian explosion of web standards. And I'm not, I don't know who came up with that, but I've I've seen that floating around. It's just, there's so much happening so quickly. Yeah, definitely. Like maybe you could list some examples and I can maybe fill in a couple more based on what I hear you say of things that are like maybe in the past, you know, a year or two and looking pretty good sense of landing in the next year or two. Yeah. So there's uh, container queries that have been mooted about for years now, uh, suddenly look like they're going to be implemented like this year, like, like widely implemented this year. Uh, cascade layers, which has been the sort of thing that people have been interested in for a long time, you know, sort of this ability to group parts of your style sheets together and and sort of have them be able to override anything else, no matter what the has. Uh, people have wanted a parent selector since basically there have been selectors, certainly since there was the child selector. Uh, and that was 1998 when the child selector was, was basically formally introduced. Amazing, right? Like... That that was in specs in 1998 and 1999 that yeah. we basically were like, it, it seems so obvious, like you need that, right? And the reason why it's taken this long, I mean, there are a lot of reasons it's taken this long, but the, the primary reason was performance concerns and work that's been done recently by Byung-Woo Lee here at Agalia and um, uh, Auntie, uh, Auntie Kosovo, is it? Mm -hmm. Apple. Um, they've figured out and um, some really interesting ways of minimizing the performance hit uh, that that ancestor selectors will create. And that's the thing. Like there was a child selector. And so people said, well, can we have a parent selector? And the answer for a long time was no. That would grind browsers to a halt. And that was probably true at the time. I mean, that was, was 20 years ago, right? Browsers were not as fast as they are now. That the has pseudo class is not just a parent selector. It's an arbitrary ancestor level selector. Yeah. It's, it was originally in specs as subject because um, in CSS terms, like you write a rule and the, the properties and values of the rule are applied to the subject. And thus far in the history of CSS, it's always the rightmost thing in the selector that's the subject. Right. <clears throat> and it's very carefully designed that way for performance reasons. But uh, we should also probably note for somebody who's maybe listening that like early on in CSS, uh, just that actually had a lot of performance concerns. You remember like way back, we would talk about like, well, that is not really very performant or you have to keep an eye on how many rules you have because it was not really very practical. So we've spent the last 20 years, more or less, <laughs> uh, making that super efficient because of that particular construct. So when changes happen, they basically walk up the tree to the root because there's always a um, like a very short path from anywhere in the tree to the root. Mm -hmm. And they check backwards, so they eliminate things really quickly. And we've added things like bloom filters and all, all kinds of really interesting ways to like shortcut out of that as quickly as possible because you know, the fastest work is the work you don't actually have to do. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's really interesting. And the, the problem with that has always been that the ask to invert that 
uh, opens a new problem for which nobody has ever really provided a proven workable solution. And uh, the ones that we had kind of didn't seem like they were going to work. Mm -hmm. And this creates a problem because like you wind up with this blockage where you're asking for vendors to like invest in research that may or may not lead anywhere. <laughs> right. Right. Um, so like, we don't even know the scale or scope of the problem. We just like, we know enough about what we do and, and what the pains we've had. Mm -hmm. And we know that like, changing that would be really, really hard at 60 frames per second. And so, yeah, that, that's how that up for a really long time. And since you already have kind of breached into this, um, the thing that got us out of that is some new investment from none of the browsers actually is from IO, uh, the company that makes the... And, and to be clear, that's E-Y-E-O for IO. <laughs> yes. And, you know, they said this is, uh, while this is like a nice to have, it's always been like a really nice to have on the web. I would argue more than nice to have because the separation of concerns requires powerful features, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That, that's what I think, right? I think that uh, all of the workarounds and solutions to this have been like use some JavaScript and place new class in there or something. Right. But the promise of CSS, we can only really live up to the promise of it if you can write your markup and your styles kind of separately you know right um <clears throat> and without subject it's like actually really hard to live up to that 100 percent. yeah there are many problems in styling that you can't do them without some form of well i need to mark a thing up here or i need to know that this thing is inside this other thing so i can style you know this other thing um i, I need to know that this, one of the simplest ones is if I want to remove the link underline from any link that has an image inside of it, I need to have a way to mark all the links that have images inside of them. And, you know, you could do that with like literally typing class equals into your HTML, or you could have JavaScript do it, which is how a lot of people have done it. With has, you can just do it straight in the CSS. You don't need uh extra script overhead you don't need uh manual maintenance of the html all that sort of thing you could just say a has image you know do blah and you're styling the a instead of the the image there are to be clear that's sort of the most reduced version of this class of problems there are plenty more you know i want to be able to style this product card based on whether or not there's a price in it Right. Until now, the only way you could do that was to have your CMS or your whatever do the work on the back end to say, okay, is there a price in here? Okay, if there's a price, then we're going to add a class to this card that says has price. And then we can style based on that. But now you don't need to do that sort of thing anymore. Yeah, there's any, there's any number of cases you can come up with. I mean, there's yeah. like literally just hundreds that I've had over the course of my career that I've been like, oh, I mean. Well, I have to come up with some clever back end or build time thing that like analyzes the data and like injects some new context pushing up mechanism to do this kind of thing. And that's always been painful. And like since you since we already have like begun touching on this a little bit, uh, first, big thanks to IO. Yep. And they sponsored the research, which is amazing because, um, you know, they did the thing that browsers wouldn't do. Right. Um, but then once we unblock the nuclear standoff, uh, <laughs> suddenly Safari said, oh, yeah, no, hey, look, uh, we can do that. And in fact, they shipped it before our Chromium implementation. And that's amazing. Like, I think this this blockage thing comes up a lot. You already mentioned container queries. And it's like similar there. Like it was all performance concerns and complexity and circularity and things like that. And here too, Agalia invested like almost a year in different efforts uh, behind the scenes and talking to different people trying to get this unblocked. Uh, we had a proposal ready to go and we shopped it around and everybody supported it. Thought it was a good idea. We were like, let's do it. Right. Except for David Barron. Uh, David Barron said, eh, I have this other idea and uh, I need some time to like write it up 
but we were kind of a forcing function then, right? Like we, we were, we had sort of the pressure to like, well, it's sort of now or never, you know? And so David did write that up and it was actually really, really amazing and interesting, you know? Uh, and that is what we end up doing instead. But like Egalia actually the same week that they, that Google announced they were going to pick up David's proposal. Uh, we show like we had a running demo that we showed on, on Twitter. Like, I think it was like the day before or something like that. But yeah, this is this is really this is really interesting. We spent a bunch of time on those two things, but can you name some other ones? Uh, CSS color space uh, support, like space color spaces beyond RGB or sRGB or you know the stuff that we're used to. Um, and I don't just mean color notation, right? So there's things like HWB, HSL, OK Lab, Lab and OK Lab, yeah, um, are a couple of color notations like color value formats, some of which can go outside the RGB space, but browsers historically have been confined to the RGB space. Like you could have a color, you could define any color format you wanted that went outside the RGB space. Browsers would just, you know, clip you off at the edges of the RGB color space. While there's stuff like Display P3, which uh, WebKit supports now, uh, there's, I think, there's another one that I've just blanked on, um, but other browsers are are looking to add the color spaces. Um, there's smaller stuff like in the CSS realm anyway, like uh, Gap, the property Gap um, used to be Grid Gap, and as soon as Grids had gaps, pretty much every other layout system or you know proponents thereof said, "Why can't we have that for Flexbox or?" multi-column or whatever. And so it's making its way out. You can you can have gaps in Flexbox now just by saying gap. Yeah, such a small seeming thing, but like big, big impact and, and really yeah. exciting. Right, because I, I mean, I've been to entire conference talks in the past about, okay, so you've got your Flexbox layout and you want your Flexbox items to be distributed, but they should never get any closer than this amount, but they should also not be like skewed to one side. So you can't use side margins here, these hacks that we've come up with, you know, sometimes. And they they have to be responsive too, right? Right. And sometimes hacks evolve JavaScript. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes it's really clever usage of stuff, right? Because there, because there was no gap support Flexbox at those times. And those talks were absolutely needed at those moments. But now all that stuff, we can just pretty much start, getting rid of because we could just say in our flex display flex and then gap you know 10 pixels or 1m or whatever i mean it just makes so much sense i mean you you remember back when all we had was float layouts right and it's like uh, i remember man what i would layouts man (laughs) what i would have given for like just i what i want is some space between these two things you know right uh, like such a huge, huge win, and and a and robust space, right? You could you could separate floats by setting the right margin, but that only worked as long as the like the layout never changed or the writing directionality didn't change, you know. Or like, what if you have like sometimes an element is optional, and like what right. where do you attach the things? And the interfaces are changing and evolving all the time. Yep. This is a source of a lot of churn for a lot of projects that I worked on is like, just we need space between these two things, you know, and, and like just getting that right and keeping it right was actually way harder than I I think it should have been. I'll float a spacer gif. Yeah. I think also like we got classes in JavaScript and not just classes, but like increasingly robust ones with like, private class fields and methods and things like that. Yeah. The the fact that now in JavaScript you can you can really do strong encapsulation. Again, like I've I have seen talks, conference talks about how you can like best practices for simulating encapsulation in JavaScript, right? Because there was no such thing as private classes and fields. And now there are private classes and fields which are you know completely encapsulated natively. You know, if you define a private field inside of a function, it does not escape outside that function. Stuff like yeah. that. Um yeah, uh I w- I was also I was going to mention um on the CSS realm there's a the dialogue element and the backdrop pseudo element. It's a pseudo element, right? 
pseudo class, pseudo element. I think it's a pseudo element. Um, yeah, the 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 ability to not only pop up a dialogue, but also to be able to say, here's the the backdrop I want for this modal dialogue that has appeared. So by backdrop, in this case, I, generally that means, well, you know, like that's a little bit of a, of a dark pattern or at least an unwelcome pattern. But, you know, you go to a website and you're halfway through the article and it pops up a thing that says subscribe now. And like the rest of the page sort of washes out or grays out or something. That's that wash out or grad is, is the backdrop. And, and I guess those things will be more performant, which is a win. I would like to see them be less persistent, <laughs> but less prevalent, but yeah, I, I know people, I, it will be really, really interesting to see how this shakes out. Like, I'm not sure like if we like, we could probably do like a whole entire show on that, but um, you know, like it's questionable to me, like what could you like override, show dialogue uh in some clever ways and you have an ad blocker <laughs> you know well now that we have has support thanks to io we could do a you know any element that has a dialogue element set it to display none or something so dialogue is actually really interesting it, it's full of new features it introduces the really top layer Introduce mm -hmm. the concept of top layer, and um, also that thing you're talking about about like what it, what does it mean when something is on the top layer? That's like largely about rendering. But then if you look at the HTML spec, um, it also says that the things in there uh, become inert. Mm -hmm. it, it uses this term inert. Um, yeah. So dialogue was stuck for a really long time on. Um, Actually, d disagreements largely around accessibility, which is interesting because a lot of people want it for accessibility, right? They want to say, like, this is an accessible dialogue. Mm. But <clears throat> there were some disagreements around, like, how some of those things should actually work. So inert is uh, a thing that was described by the HTML spec. And uh, it turns out, like, that is a really useful concept all on its own. And it didn't exist yet. So Alice Boxhall... Previously, at the time, at Google, and I worked on that. Um, uh -huh. And she did the implementation in Chrome. And uh, after a, a couple of years, there was an implementation done by uh, Emilio in, in Firefox. Uh, it was a little bit different, but uh, it sorted out. We had a polyfill. It was used by like Twitter and Slack, and uh, I think a, a bunch of places. If I if I'm recalling correctly, we had a couple of projects going on. But I think Inert was one of those ones that was used on. A bunch of them. We did it as part of open prioritization. We offered inert, um, and it got really, really popular. So, uh, a segment of people were really excited about it for dialogues, but a segment of people were also excited about it because you could use it for more than just a modal dialogue. Um, like what? Uh, like, for example, potentially drawers. Um, interface components are <laughs> are complicated. I just. Uh, wrote a blog post on this actually they kind of cross influence each other and we come up with sort of new paradigms and um there is this concept of a drawer and then there are lots of things that are like drawers um and the lines between them get sometimes blurry and vague but there are some drawer constructs that are effectively like a dialogue but they're not sort of presented as a dialogue but you do want to sort of like trap the focus in there and have it be on the top layer, more or less. Um, so inert would let you do that. It's a way of saying uh, all the stuff in here is just forget visibility. It's not necessarily connected with visibility. We may choose to just gray it out, but uh, it shouldn't be selectable. Like it should be as if it didn't really exist. It's just like a a, a ghost of... <laughs> its real existence. So an, so an inert element is one that you can't really interact. You may be able to see it, but you can't interact with it. Right. And to accessibility, it's like as if it's it wasn't not there, there at all. Right. So, so yeah. that takes it out of the accessibility tree. It takes it out of the accessibility tree. It takes it out of sequential focus order, like mm. a whole bunch of stuff. There's a lot of things that it juggles. So the fact that that got, uh, that didn't win actually, like, uh, but it came a really close second. Like it looked for a minute like that one would win. And I think that the combination of 
it having two implementations and it there being a lot of excitement around it really helped push uh, Apple to go, I mean, we should get this across the finish line along with dialogue. Um, and so we did that. And that's awesome. That was just shipped just within the last few weeks, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. For, for for the benefit of those who may be listening in the future, we're recording this right at the very beginning of May 2022. So it would have been within, you know, the March, April time frame of 2022. I believe it is still behind a flag in in technology preview, but I, I could be wrong about that. Um but it but it's really it's really close. Like that's just the way that the process works, even when a thing receives no changes from then until it ships, like you have to go through technology preview right and it i mean like you said it nearly won open prioritization it actually lost out to focus visible and webkit yes and getting that implemented which agalia did which i also worked on with alice box <laughs> uh both of those were our our proposals um yeah so we did the final implementation of that as well and um that is amazing like there's a lot of happiness around that i think yeah but also like there's there's like all different kinds of stuff that's like super relevant. There's like internationalization stuff. JavaScript in particular is getting all Mm -hmm. kinds of really good internationalization stuff like baked right into it. The ability to do internationalized date formatting, number formatting, to be clear, to be able to take a a point in time that's, let's say it's represented as a Unix time, you know, number of seconds from the epoch or whatever, um, and render that in an internationalized way, you know, in you know J- Japan, it's rendered one way. In America, it's rendered a different way. In Europe, it's rendered yet a third way, et cetera. And um, a thing that we've been working on, there are two ways to pronounce it, either temporal or temporal. I usually say temporal, but whatever. Basically taking the moment.js library and making that native to JavaScript with a whole lot of extra stuff that moment.js never actually had, which as you might expect, is is intertwined with that internationalization stuff, day formatting and time formatting and, and other things like that. And that's starting to appear in browsers. I know that engineers at Agalia have been adding parts of the temporal API to WebKit, at least the technology previews. I don't think they've shipped publicly yet. And it's not all of the API yet. And temporal has been really interesting to me Anyone who's done JavaScript and had to do date programming has come to curse the date object, from what I can tell. Um, the temporal API is 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 much better, but it's also it's not just like one thing. It's it's actually broken up into sections, and so these uh, these various interfaces are are being implemented one at a time. The last I checked, we've done about half of them. But it's possible that there have been a couple more that I missed recently. I think that is super interesting. So interesting that we did a whole podcast episode on it. So if you're listening to this, uh, you can go listen to that. And we actually get into it with some of the champions who were actually from the Moment library, the Moment project, and mm-hmm. uh, about why it wound up being not moment-like it's it's actually quite a bit different than mo- moment in the ways that eric is saying mm. javascript is it, it gained its java date stuff it it gained its date stuff from java mm. but that was very very early java and even java was like oh yeah no that's no good <laughs> Um, and they added a bunch of other stuff that people use instead but because of the way that the web works that's just kind of like cooking time for javascript so there was like kind of no way to fix it and we've just lived with that for all this time and so it's like what a huge thing because moment is a really good library it's like probably one of the best ones or uh the one that kind of is the uh spin-off project of that i can't remember the name of it off the top of my head is maybe better too Mm. but it's huge like because this involves doing a lot of stuff and having a lot of knowledge to get this right. Right. So for those who, who missed the earlier podcast, both moment and, and temporal are aware of time zones. They're aware of summertime shifts. Like when, when, you know, what locations move to summertime and when for like every year, Um, you know, every time zone in the world, which 
is way more complicated than it sounds, even for people who have a passing familiarity with with time zones, because there are time zones that are like 15 minutes off their adjacent time zones sometimes, for example. Anyway, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, with with moment and, and with temporal, you can say, all right, I have this date and time, right? I have, I'm just, I'm going to pick the date and time. It's, I have, you know, 2.47 p.m. on Monday, May 2nd, 2022. And I want to know how many seconds it is until a date three and a half years in the future in a different time zone for whatever reason, but, you know. You, you're doing some kind of a countdown to a party. I don't know, whatever, right? And I, you know, I want to know how long, how many, for that matter, how many days is it until this particular point in time in a different time zone, different country, whatever. And it will tell you, it'll tell you to the nanosecond <laughs> what that interval is. And then you can, there are all these like methods that let you take that figure and express it in days or in years, months, and days, or whatever. And you don't even have to match calendaring systems. You can you can feed it the date and time that I gave in the American format. And you can give the other date and time in the like the uh the Hebrew calendar, right? And it just it's all taken care of. You don't have to do any conversion yourself. It all happens in the back end. And that's all got to be built into the browser, right? All of that knowledge either had to be, well, it had to be built into Moment.js. And it also all has to be built into the browser. That's not, a, neither of those is a trivial undertaking. Yeah. And like, there, if you listen to that podcast, you'll hear a couple of other examples of just like phenomenally weird sorts of things in in time and events like so, something that happened in world war ii that like briefly for these three days affected a calendar or something like that and if you really want to do some historical analysis about time mm -hmm. like you you need that you need to know that so right um yeah all that is very very complicated to get right and that i think it's really exciting but then also we have um shadow realms uh, is uh, yeah. you're gonna have to explain this one to me because every time someone explains Shadow Realms to me, I get confused. <laughs> Shadow Realms, like the easy, the high level pitch of Shadow Realms is that uh, the all of the stuff in JavaScript executes in a realm. So a realm is sort of the context, I guess, right? Okay. Um, and you could spin up two different things, and they each have their own realm, and the realms have like whatever the the information for that little container of stuff that you're running in mm -hmm. um and uh like each window in different things on the web have their own like sandboxing basically right okay so if i open if i open a youtube window and a wikipedia window each one of those is its own realm right there's the youtube realm is in that window and the Wikipedia realm is in that window. Is that right? Those, those two instances like have different ones that are sand, well, that are sandboxed from one another. Right. So you can't have Wikipedia suddenly stop my YouTube or whatever. Well, so the, the question has always been like, well, we would kind of like something like that for different purposes that don't require iframes and also have some differences. Uh, we have a couple of blog posts that are linked that explain this much, much better than I could. But, um, you know, for example, like if you have a iframe, can you walk in and out between them or something by references? Do Can you get access to the global somehow? And so this, this is a way that you could, uh, at least in theory, build some like this stuff is completely uh, like isolated. It doesn't, it doesn't share anything with the outside and like you have to have a way to, for those to operate together. So this is a really complicated kind of idea and you know, that's developing and there's an implementation being worked on in WebKit. I think that's super exciting. Uh, it's being done by Salesforce. Now, like most people won't probably use this directly but that mm. doesn't mean that they won't use it like a, a good another example is off screen canvas um i i gave a talk about this last year like most people are like oh canvas i don't know cool i guess 
uh, right. like a lot of people don't use it. You could go a whole career and and never program against Canvas, right? Yeah. Uh, but you use it every day. Like you literally use it every day. Uh, really? Because yeah, yeah. Because uh, like maps, for example, all use the Canvas. So even though you, as a developer, like don't directly program against the canvas, like maybe use like a charting library and that use the canvas or use a mapping library and that use the canvas. Or as a user, you use charts and maps and Google Docs and all, all kinds of things that are like entirely canvas based. So yeah, the off screen canvas uh, is really interesting because when the canvas was introduced, it was uh, Apple actually introduced it. Yep. And it was a, uh, an image, but with a programmatic drawing interface. And because of when it was introduced, I think there were not even browser tabs back then. You just remember those days when you had just like the window, the browser oh, I, window? I remember. I'm trying to remember. I feel like Canvas was 2008? Four, four, I think. Was 2004, it, was it I think. Far? Yeah. Okay. Uh, All right. I could, I could be wrong. Wow. It, it, it could, I could be wrong. Uh, you're probably right. The W3C had a big meeting to decide what to do with HTML applications, which were not really supposed to exist. Uh, but a group of people said, and yet they do. <laughs> and the state of them is really terrible, and we should do something about that. Yeah, I just checked. You're right. It was 2004. Yeah. Okay. So so this is like literally, literally the beginning, because the meeting... Uh, that established HTML5 was also in 2004. Um, that led to the spin-out creation of the Wetwig. But yeah, that's uh, I think that's super interesting. But the historical notion of that, though, is that, um, you know, we didn't have, like, workers back then. No. <laughs> like, all, a lot of our ideas were a lot simpler. And so mm. basically, there was the main thread. And the canvas and all its operations are synchronous and they work on and block the main thread. Right. This, the same thing that's trying to lay out the rest of the page. Yeah. Right. Uh, and also the thing that receives user input Yeah, and like blocks rendering. So, um, so if you have maps and you want to like pan and zoom around the map, um, you want to like draw things like you don't want to do that blocking the main thread. Right. Um, and this is a really big deal if you're not like on a high end iPhone. Um, if you're on like a lower end piece of hardware, something much lesser, which is what embedded systems are, right? Right. And so interestingly, uh, off-screen canvas, which will benefit everybody in their real day-to-day -day lives, right? every single day was sponsored by Comcast. <laughs> right. Because they were using canvas to run the UI on their set-top boxes. Exactly, right. And and they wanted it to be less clunky, more performant. Yeah. Right. So because right, because of that, they they hired us to make that happen. And so the the payoff there is that I we've all I, I know everyone's had that experience of like trying to move really quickly across a map and like chunks just aren't loading because or, or, you know, the whole thing slows down. Off-screen canvas goes a long way towards fixing that. It makes it way more performant. Definitely. Uh, you probably have seen that, like, in an airplane or something like that. If you have, like, somewhere where there's, like, a map that you can point and drag around. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, those things in your airplane are, they're not as capable as your iPhone, right? Like, hardware-wise, they don't spend that kind of money on each. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's another class of embedded devices that would definitely benefit from something like off-screen canvas. And for that matter, I mean, off-screen canvas is, is a, is a great optimization. And there's also been recently like hardware acceleration of SVG, yes. which tons of people, I'm sure lots of people listening to, to, to this would say, I, I never use SVG anyway, or when I do, it's just a little icon. What do I care about hardware? But acceleration you do. Of SVG? But you, <sighs> right. Right. Because... <laughs> because no because i mean so many other things it's, it's very similar like uh there are uh plenty of people who do svg like they do a lot of svg work but mm -hmm. also a lot of us use libraries and and other components that do use svg like use a lot of it yeah green sock comes to mind immediately so you're abstracted away from it you don't even realize that the underlying 
stack is actually SVG or or Canvas or whatever, right? Right. But yeah, like DataViz and all, all kinds of things. Uh, and honestly, I would love to see more maps be SVG. Um, rather yeah, than... it's it's there are some experiments around that. Yep. It's like actually very complicated to do, um, and it is a lot different than a lot of what is done with maps today. But I, I agree, it would be really really interesting. Um, but yeah, SVG. Uh, that was blocked for the longest of times. And there was a lot of discussion about like, well, somebody should do something about that someday. <laughs> there were plans to do things. Uh, but this was a really hard problem because the uh, SVG engine was one of those things that uh, didn't change. Like you went WebKit to Blink and, and it pretty much stayed the same, you know? had the same architecture and everything. But that actually came from uh, the 90s. And it was done by two guys who now work at Egalia, the original SVG engine. And that was done before CSS existed and got a bunch of investment. And so even though it contains similar concepts and there's a lot of alignment between them, they're just completely different engines. And so like, how do you solve all the problems? Well probably you need to begin by like aligning those and redoing the implementation of SVG, which is like, oh my God, a whole thing. So we did that. Uh, we said we were doing that. And here too, suddenly that really lit a fire. That that was uh, sponsored by uh, Vorwerk, the, the company who makes the thermal mix cooking machine. Right. Because they have a WebKit uh touchscreen in there. Uh, I don't know actually if it is a touchscreen, but they have a WebKit display. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And they needed uh, to hardware accelerate their uh, SVG work because SVGs are actually really important on... SVGs and canvases are really important on embedded devices. They, yeah. they tend to look a lot less like a HTML and a lot more like physical controls and stuff like that. Mm. A lot more visual. And it's, yeah, it's interesting... I that Vorwerk interest in getting SVG to be better is a very close parallel to Comcast wanting Canvas to be better. Absolutely. And, and I could easily see where, because of the work that was done for one of those companies, the other company might say, Oh, we could use more of that. Like Comcast might decide that they wanted, you know, if SVG is hardware accelerated now, they might decide that they want to do more of that and less Canvas. Yeah. Your work might decide, oh, yeah, hey, Canvas is is much better. We could we could make use of that for for these things. Not necessarily a complete switch over. Right? Yeah. But a lot more blending because and and again, that leaks out to everybody, right? The, yeah, and web authors. I think that's the, right. the bigger thing is like it, uh, a rising tide lifts all boats here um, because we're, this is the commons, right? And um, the more people working on the commons, the better, right? The more people we have enabled to uh, help affect priority by like doing some work mm -hmm. and saying like, I can understand this isn't important to you, but if you're not like actively opposed to it, like we'll do the work. That's actually great for everybody because um, not everybody can see from where they sit the relative benefit of this. And certainly we'll all, as in the case of maps, enjoy the benefits. Like you will enjoy that web maps get a lot more fluid and, and speedy and like everybody will appreciate that. I feel like some work we've got, we've got, in the pipeline is is going to be similar. And I'll be interested to see how the work on MathML and MathML core actually benefits from and also informs the stuff with, you know, SVG and Canvas and all that sort of thing. Um, or, yeah. or, if, or if it does. But I mean, that's that's a thing that's coming. And, and I think that fits, that reminds me very much of what you were saying about, you know, most people might not see how it's relevant or beneficial to them right because the vast majority of people probably do not think that math markup is relevant to what they do or what they consume and yet <laughs> right yeah absolutely um like uh i went my entire 
let, let's not talk about how long it is because it's a little embarrassing at this point. Mm. Uh, that's not embarrassing, but uh, I don't I don't want to discuss how old I am. There we um, but it's a long career I've had now, and uh, you know I've never had to render advanced math. Like I have worked mm. professionally on web applications and websites, and I have never had to really render much math right um yeah it's not what you're doing every day and you think like well it's maybe not that important but uh if you want to share information on the web uh like this is the way you do that with math Mm -hmm. in a way that treats it as text that doesn't require javascript that um works with all of the concepts of the web like css like copying and pasting accessibility like yeah. this is the thing that's received a lot of attention um and if you know i mean i hate to use the same example all the time but if heaven forbid there were a global pandemic and we wanted researchers to be able to share information that involves like math and chemistry and stuff like that and we had to send our children to school to learn things on the web math is important to that <laughs> One could argue. I've had I've been working on a on a side project with a colleague, um, that actually involves quite a bit of math, <laughs> um, and we use MathJax, uh, which is a JavaScript library, and it makes it really easy. Like I could express all of the math in in uh, LaTeX, and then MathJax library will show you the the MathML version of that, and it makes it as accessible as it can, and it uses SVG to render some of the stuff. The library is 17 megabytes, like literally half the entire weight of the project. Well, so the the MathJax library is more bytes than the actual text content. And this is an entire book we're talking about. Um, And it's in the vicinity of the weight of all of the images, which nothing against MathJax. MathJax does an incredible job at what it does, and it has to be 17 megabytes to do all of that stuff. But, you know, I would be, I would have been a lot happier if we could have not needed that, right? Because one of the things that I've, I've been thinking about is how do we make this so that it's like service worker driven so that you can just install the whole book on your phone or your computer or whatever, and you can then have it completely offline, right? Um, you can access it no matter where you are, um, should should you want to, and that's more difficult <laughs> because of the because of the overall weight. And you know, like I say, seventy megabytes of it is just this JavaScript library, which which is necessary because equations are integral to this to the text. Um, you can't you, you you can't understand what's going on without them. But yeah, I would that that's a that's unusual most people don't run into that sort of thing but again much like with off-screen canvas and and svg hardware acceleration for these very specific things like very few of us work on embedded well maybe a lot of us work on embedded devices but very few of us work on uh set-top boxes uh for um a cable company but that work benefits everybody whether or not they work in that in that kind of area yeah definitely um i think it's possible that you don't have the most optimal uh, use of MathJax there. <laughs> uh, we ended up we ended up needing a lot of it, so I don't know. <laughs> MathJax has like a lot of things. Like they have um, like uh, basically like an SVG rendering module and mm-hmm. an HTML rendering module and a MathML rendering module. Um, yeah. They have tech and LaTeX both support as well as ASCII math and a bunch of other things. Yeah. But you there, there's like a lot of tree shaking that you can do to get that to be uh, definitely not 17 megabyte. That seems really big. Mm. But yeah, probably there is a distro that's just like, this is everything. <laughs> and right. I imagine that would be probably pretty large. Um, and maybe it's also like not minified or something that contains a lot of documentation. I don't know. But yeah, it's, I mean, either way you go, like, it's going to be a non-trivial amount of JavaScript. Um, Like, how big it has to be before it starts uh, really impacting you is difficult to say, in part because, um, you know, math is text. Um, Where else do we 
like not render the text until the JavaScript loads. Like there's always going to be a problem, right? Uh, because everything then has to reflow. Um, and when we're executing JavaScript again, it's and when we're touching the DOM, it's like it's all single threaded. So yeah. uh, you you know you'll see a lot of sites that use MathJax. Like once they render, like they look actually really nice. Like oh yeah, um, they the no definitely no knock on the people who made that. I'm thankful that they made it and kept us going for as long as we have. Um, yeah, but it isn't. Uh, it isn't ideal in a, in a whole bunch of ways. Uh, it's not text. You have to wait until the document loads or you have to pull the thing or use a mutation observer or something and like know when new math enters the page so that you can as quickly as possible stop everything, turn that into math and do as minimal reflow as possible. And uh, if you have something that has a lot of math, it's it will take a long time to do all the math. Yeah, I've been having my version of the flash of unfaunted text, um, which people might remember from early days of web fonts. I mean, you can still get that these days, but I have the flash of unmathed latex or un SVG latex or whatever, where if you're most of the way through the page and you hit reload, like for a half second or a quarter second, you can see the raw latex notation before it gets re-rendered into beautiful equations with integral signs and whatever. And that's on your setup too, right? Like that's not on a a cheap uh phone. Yeah. I mean my my laptop is in fairness almost a decade old now, but um it's still I mean it's still capable of doing pretty but much it's everything. A Mac, right? and, yeah, it's a it's a 2013 MacBook Pro and it was fairly top of the line when I got it. Um, so it's still fully capable and it's certainly more powerful than just about any embedded device. Um, yeah, but you, you, you run into that. I, and I, I think even with a, with a, if I went out and bought a machine today, I would probably still see some of this stuff because at a certain point, it's less about which generation is your processor and just how much does the browser have to do? Uh, Fred Wang, by the way, has, I don't know if I showed you this, but he has a uh, LaTeX custom element mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. you put the LaTeX in the element and it will render it as MathML, like for uh, the actual rendering. I 100% want this already. <laughs> Yeah, it's really interesting, but honestly, that is better done at a pre-process time because then you like you still have to yeah, know yeah. how to process LaTeX, which is a big ask, right? Like it's it's still a, a pretty non-trivial. It's way more focused, and it is very fitting with everything else that works in the web. And you know, you can plug into all the things that you would expect to plug into about controlling font sizes, and you know, nothing is just weird but um right you know there are plenty of markdown elements too and like there <laughs> i think there are cases where they make sense like I, I think uh if you had like the github preview thing that right. seems like a fine use of like a custom element that would render your markdown yeah mm-hmm. you know for most cases you would not want to send markdown to the browser you would want to send the generated stuff XML, by the way uh we are getting very very close to sending the intent I'm hoping that we do that uh, somewhere around that don't make any quotes just yet, but okay. <laughs> I'm hoping that we do that somewhere around the web engine hack fest that we can announce an intent uh, mm. to ship. That would be awesome. That would be. Yeah. hundred percent. And uh, there's, there's one more that I, that I want to want us to touch on. Cause you know so much about it, which is uh, spicy sections. <laughs> and who, who decided to call them spicy sections and why? I just have to. Okay, no, I can tell you the story of that. So I don't know if you know this, but um, uh, back in 2015, Leonie Watson, uh, Steve Faulkner, myself, and uh, maybe Charles McAthy Neville um, were at a TPAC. I was describing some things and asking some questions, and I, I had this idea. We kind of talked through it and we came up with a proposal together called panel sets. Okay. And a panel set was like a single construct through which you could offer some kind of like API that would cover several of the ARIA patterns. Um, 
because a lot of them, like by here, I mean tabs, accordions, and like a stack of progressive disclosures. Mm -hmm. Carousels don't have an accessible pattern, but we imagine that maybe some kinds of carousels could also, like they're all of them are around showy Heidi things, right? Like they're just showy Heidi things with labels. And uh, so we, we made this proposal together. It was called Panel Sets. And uh, nobody was ready for that at that point. And uh, <laughs> it had some ideas in it that, like we, we made a polyfill, we tested it, um, got some use, and it had some issues. So we just decided to put it on the back burner. But, um, but it came back. And I had an idea for a new proposal, and uh, I didn't want to call it panel set. Okay. Because of confusion around that. And we had a lot of debate about what to call it. And I had this idea that, like, maybe these are, like, I don't even know if they should be properly tabs and, and stuff. Like, I, I think this is a pattern where the thing I'm focused on is when that is not core to what it is. Um, so there are applications in which the tab is fundamentally important. Your browser is an example, right? Like the, like mm -hmm. the, the tab is a very important specific thing, but there are a number of things that are simpler tabs. that are just about displaying content in a document. And we already have ways to do that, like headings and content. Right. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, I noticed that we have this parallel that for some reason we haven't latched onto at all, which is scroll panes. Hmm. Uh, so scroll panes uh, exist in almost every UI toolkit. Like that's a thing, a scroll pane. And you create one and that's what you put your text in and you do that like with code. But on the web, we don't have a scroll pane. Uh, we have the concept of overflow and that's just, it's a matter of display, right? Like you don't, mm. you don't have a programmatic API that is exclusively, this is and always will be a scroll pane. There's no scroll pane element. Um, and so right. I had this idea that like, well, what we, what we want to do in a lot of these cases is not fundamental. I think even summary details is kind of broken because like, what if you want to print that thing? Like, can you display it? Can you cause it to display as like a heading and content? Hmm. <laughs> what if you're in reader mode? What if you do find in page? Like we have not answered a lot of these questions. And for a lot of websites, it's not the natural control that you would want it to be when it's about the text. Hmm. Does that make sense or no? Uh -huh. Yeah. So we batted around like a whole bunch of ideas of what, what to call it. Um, and Dave Rupert, frequently says spicy divs. Uh, we've had uh, a bunch of talks about this. Like I was on their show, I don't know, two, three years ago. And we talked about how a lot of HTML elements are just spicy divs. Like they either don't have anything, like there's nothing programmatically special about them. They don't have any API surface. Maybe their whole entire implementation is like a CSS rule in the style sheet. <laughs> And it's like, okay, it costs a lot of money and time to do that. And well, like, is it is it beneficial to spend that money working on more spicy divs? Or do we want to work on things that like can't easily be done with a single UA rule or something, you know? Right. And he called those things spicy divs. And in this discussion, uh, Mia said, uh, what I really want these to be is, uh, I don't know. And I said, well, I want them to be what the section element should have been, I kind of think, right? Oh. Um, and I don't know what to propose it. And I don't know if I'm proposing it is a new element or that we can like mix it into some existing elements. Like, I don't know. So Mia said, let's just call them spicy sections. All right. Uh, and that is the very long story of spicy sections. But they are, interestingly, they are, we, ha we had a kind of a vote uh, on what should we call them for real. Mm -hmm. And the answer that I picked was panel sets. <laughs> so, uh, oh. 
I guess that's like some vindication that that was a good name. Uh, I was not trying to push that. It's just where we landed. Time is a flat circle, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's fine that it was a long-winded explanation of where the name came from because it actually also explains what they are. Um, right. And yeah, I'd, having having messed around with them as web components a little bit. Yeah, really compelling. The ability, the ability to be able to say, hey, in this context, it should be like this. And in this other context, it should act completely differently. Right. Yeah. Like not just look different, but actually be interactively different. Um, we don't have a lot of that. Not Well, we don't have a lot of that that's not completely driven by JavaScript. We don't. Yeah, no, we don't. And that, that was kind of the, the purpose of the article that I wrote and asking people to, uh, like, I don't know if it's a good idea. Like, it, it's certainly, you know, like we shouldn't base a whole future on an idea that I had when I wrote a particular blog post, but it feels worth exploring, you know, uh, and we were exploring it and, uh, definitely some, uh, interesting things have come out of that. So tab Atkins had a proposal for CSS toggles, uh, which he claimed would allow us to do a lot of these things. Um, they have since fleshed that out and revived that. And mm -hmm. really a huge part of the reason why is, because we did the work on space sections. Um, right. Uh, I say we, but that actually was a like a community that involved uh, Mia and uh, Dave Rupert and uh, John Neal. Mm -hmm. uh, Matthew C. Phillips was involved a little bit at the beginning. So was uh, Zach Leatherman. Yeah, there were a bunch of people. I feel like I'm probably leaving off somebody and I feel bad about it now. But um yeah, I think that also then relates to uh, Focus Group, which is an interesting proposal from Microsoft. And, you know, like all these things will fit together, but I think like we will get some really exciting new UI constructs. I don't know if they'll be toggles. I don't know if they'll be space sections. I don't know if they'll be focus groups, <laughs> mm. but those discussions are going to very, very rapidly lead to like actual experimentation in browsers and concrete spec proposals and polyfills that you can play with. And I think mm -hmm. we are rapidly approaching bettering like your ability to do those sorts of things that is currently like pretty snarly. Yeah. Pretty cool. Uh, I feel like we forgot stuff, but we've also been at this a while. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. We could probably go like all day. Uh, yeah. <laughs> our podcast listeners will know that uh, Brian is uh <laughs> A long talker. <laughs> well, but even even at that, just like we didn't really dive into practically any of those things. <laughs> no, we didn't dive into any of them. We could maybe do a spin out on one or two of them, but this you can see why people are really, really interested and excited. And yeah. I just want to point out that the common thread across almost all of these things, <laughs> save cascade layers. I think literally everything else that we talked about, Egalia was involved in either directly writing code or doing their early advocacy that helped to get unblocked or doing spec work or a lot of it was you my man uh well <laughs> it was come on at least with the spec work stuff uh maybe some of it um yeah. okay it's i think super fun and i'm excited yeah i'm excited like not just for that but i'm excited that we are you you gave a really great talk last year at tpac Mm -hmm. Definitely people should go watch that, but it was announcing a new open collective effort that we did. Right. Um, but I think it just really explains it well. I mean, it just explains it well is that the more people we can have, like not just individuals, but like companies that mm. can do work in the commons, we all benefit from it. So right. it's awesome. And the talk was, I think, 17 minutes. So if anyone's interested, <laughs> it's it's not a major time investment. It's not one of these, you know, oh, I have to set aside an hour kind of deals. It's not a Galio Chats podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, no comment. Guilty as charged. Okay, we should wrap it up. Yeah, probably should. Thanks, Eric. It's always fun to do these. Yeah, thank you, sir. Good time. See you.